Hello friends, I'm Yari and welcome to my channel Manicure and Murder Combo. Today we will chat about serial killer Norman John Collins. So grab your manicure kits and paint your nails with me or grab a snack or grab both as we pass no judgments here and let's get started. Before jumping into the store, I want to give you quick tips on how to maintain your regular polished manicure during vacation. One, practice doing your manicure the night before your vacation or one day before your vacation. Two, I recommend taking a top coat polish and a quick dry polish with you. Three, every other day on your vacation, apply your top coat and then after two minutes, apply your quick dry polish and that should hold you over with a fresh manicure for about seven to 14 days without any chipping. And four, just enjoy your vacation with your fabulous nails. So jumping into our story. Norman John Collins was born in Canada in 1947, the son of Richard and Loretta Chapman. Norman was the youngest of his siblings and Norman's dad would go on to abandon his family. Norman's mother made the decision to take the family out of Canada and bring them into the United States to the state of Detroit, which would prove to be a horrible decision for us here in the States. In Detroit, Norman's mother Loretta meets a man that she marries, but that marriage quickly deteriorated. Then she went on to meet a man named William Collins and they will soon marry and he legally adopted all of Loretta's children and that's how Norman becomes Norman John Collins. As sweet as the son that this man adopted Loretta's children, he was nothing but a sweet raging alcoholic and displays of and his displays of affection were given by violent outbursts. Therefore, the marriage also failed. So in total, Norman briefly had three men in his life, all which displays some form of domestic violence. At first, it doesn't seem that his family setting had an effect on Norman, who is described to be handsome and easy to talk to, but that would later change. Norman was known to be a good Catholic boy, a sports player, a good student, so much so that he graduated from high school, obtained a clerical job, and went on to attend the Eastern Michigan University to study education. However, after two years of college, Norman's grades begin to slip, and he then becomes involved in petty thefts, usually committed for entertainment purposes. There are documents that show that he at times committed some of those petty thefts with a friend named Andrew Manuel, who he meets as they dorm together. But for the most part, Norman mostly committed his petty thefts on his own. Norman, while in college, also belonged to a fraternity group, which he was later kicked out of because he was practic practicing sticky fingers on his fraternity brothers. At first, they weren't sure who was taking hold of their property, but one day Norman wrote a bad check to rent a camper trailer and he used one of the other students name as his own as he had stolen his wallet and his identification card after that there was no ignoring that norman was the sticky finger bandit unfortunately his sticky finger bad habits would be just one of his bad habits one of his bad habits sorry about that noise so anyway as word got around that norman couldn't be trusted around personal property Word also got around that Norman was also sex crazed and that he enjoyed bondage and would normally get aggressive with some of the girls that he had engaged in sexual activities with. I'm not sure when this particular incident took place that I'm going to mention now, but Norman at one point beat up his sister when he found out that she was pregnant without being married. The beating was so severe that she at one point during the assault was rendered unconscious. One thing that was extremely odd about Norman was that while he demonstrated little interest in completing his education, he didn't want to stop attending the university. It, it was later learned that it was relatively easy grounds for him to find women to date. I wouldn't say date, but let's just use the word date for now. As Norman is going around flunking school, dating girls, and stealing property, strange things start happening. So anyway, some during some time during July 1967, a young student by the name of Mary Fleezer from Eastern Michigan University goes missing, and no one has any idea where she could be. That is until August 7, when a couple of teenagers found a naked, decomposed body of a young woman who had clearly been stabbed and had her hands and feet cut off. About two days later, um, the body will be identified that of Mary. Not known at the time, but while Mary's body was in the morgue, 
Norman had presented himself as a photographer requesting to take photographs of Mary's remains as per a request of her family members, which of course was a lie. Family members didn't want photographs of her dismembered body. Anyway, Norman was denied access to Mary and was told to leave. This incident was reported to the authorities. However, the employee failed to get a proper description of Norman, and at that moment, he was not linked to the murder of Mary. Um, a year later, on July 1st, 1968, another student named Joanne Shells will go missing. Five days later, she was found naked in Ann Arbor Staff 47 time and with evidence that she had been sexually assaulted. During the investigation, detectives learned that she had been seen with fellow student Norman on the night she disappeared. But Norman, being the nice and charming young man that he was, claimed that he had an alibi for the time of the murder. And as you can predict, they took his alibi without verifying it. Um, you would think I'm recording this video outside, but I'm not. Anyway, time will go on without any leads. And approximately eight months later, another student named Jane Mixer will go missing. And on March 21st, 1969 her body was found with clothing on in a cemetery not too far from where the university resided jane had been strangled with a nylon stocking and a bullet had been fired into her brain at very close proximity i'm going to give quick notes that jane's murder had been speculated to be that of another killer as she did not fit norman's norman's mo body um jane's body later would would have three different dna's on her all belonging to three different killers but one of those killers at the time of her death was only four years old so obviously it couldn't have been the four-year-old um so anyway not too much later on march 25th 1969 construction workers near the same place that joanne's body was found stumbled on another naked corpse the body will be that of marilyn skelton Marilyn's body showed evidence that she had been brutally beaten with a hard object about her head that had crushed her skull and her female private area had been violated with a stick. Her body also held evidence that she had she was also beaten about her body with a belt like object before she passed away. Three weeks later, young Dawn Basin, just 13 years old, was found half naked, strangled with an electric cord. While detectives were investigating her case, Dawn's sweater had been found in an abandoned farmhouse about one mile from where the body of the body of Mary had been body had been found in 1967. With the sweater being found around the same location that Mary's body had been found, detectives made the decision to return to the farmhouse and conduct another canvas for a po for possible evidence that may point to the killer or to other victims. During this third search, they discovered more article of female clothing, which had not been there before, and an electric cord. Not long after that third search, somehow the farmhouse caught on fire, leaving behind five clipped lilac blossoms that had not been affected by the, flyer, by the fire. The flowers were immediately determined to have been placed there after the fire. It was assumed that the lilacs represented the dead young ladies that had been found. Then on June 9, 1969, a couple of teenage boys found the naked body of Alice Colon, who was a graduate of EMU. EMU is the place where Norman was employed, um, which I told you he had obtained that job after high school. Alice's body had evidence that she had been raped and stabbed a numerous amount of times. Her throat was slashed and she had also been shot in the head. On July 13, 1969, the naked body of Roxy Ann Phillips was found dead in California in an illegal dumping after she was reported missing on June 30, 1969. Roxy had been seen with Norman, who was reported to have been in California at the time. After Norman's arrest, which I will talk about later, his almost Oldsmobile was suspected and a fabric matching Roxy's dress was found. I feel like throwing a gallon of water on my super for using this thing to take out the garbage at this time. But obviously I won't do that. Um, so now, unfortunately, there will be one last victim named Karen Beanman. She went missing from her dorm at EMU on July 23rd. Her naked body was discovered three days later, strangled, beaten, and her breast and stomach burned with some kind of unknown liquid. 
Her underwear had also been inserted into her private areas after she had passed away. And then the under, um, when the underwear was removed and examined, it contained clipped human hair that did not belong to Karen. During the time that Karen's body was found, Norman, being the nice guy that he was, was dog sitting for his aunt and her husband, who was a state police corporal named David Leake, who happened to live in the same town, that of Eastern Michigan University. So, three days after the body of Karen was found, his aunt, her husband, and their sons returned from their vacation. And as Norman's uncle by marriage was making sure that everything was as it should be in the house, he makes his way into the basement and he no takes notice that this black paint has been splashed across the basement floor. He didn't think too much of it and just assumed that Norman must have dropped the paint. However, when his uncle returned to work, he was notified that, Nor that Norman had been questioned about one of the victims that had been found but that not to worry because norman had an alibi norman's uncle his spidey senses were activated and he said nothing but when he returned home he decided to scrape up the paint on his basement floor that revealed a brown stain underneath that didn't really hint to anything but in doing all the scraping david was forced to move his washing machine underneath and underneath the washing machine he found clumps of hair that had belonged to his sons um that they had gotten haircuts in the basement before they left on vacation anyway knowing the details about karen's case david felt the obligation to submit the hairs and samples of the stains he found to the detectives assigned to the case the brown stains, as I said, proved to be nothing of any interest, but sad to say the hairs proved to be a match to the hairs found in the underwear that were found inside the body of Karen. Norman was brought in once again and interviewed and admitted that he had spilled the paint in order to cover up what he had assumed was blood stains. Norman also went on to make admissions um, and pointed to detectives to evidence linked to the murders. Norman was arrested at this time. Norman went to trial on August 19, 1970, after three days of deliberation from the, um, from the jury. He was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for the murders of Karen. For the murder of Karen. Some say he received 20 years to life, but we're in 2021 and he's obviously still in prison. And not that it's important, but Norman did not take the stand in his own defense. His defense team did debate it, but when they asked Norman to speak, um, to speak to his mother in chambers before putting him on the stand it was decided upon their return that it wasn't a good idea both both Norman and his mother show evidence that they have been crying during their conversation which people assume that Norman's mother learned who her son really was um, anyway during the trial Norman was described as, as an oversex man had a history of sexual harassment that had never been reported the abuse against his sister was also brought up. It was also shared that Norman often had obsessed with mutilation. I don't know when in his life he had obsessed with mutilation, but obviously somebody was in trial that said that he was. Um, other women also came forward that Norman had attempted to pick them to pick them up on the same day that he had picked up some of his other victims. Norman's aunt's basement was also reinspected, and blood traces were found that were not under the paint. Um, Norman's defense attorney did try to argue that no debris other than the hairs were found on Cameron's underwear, which was not true. They also had argued that the hairs could have been picked up from anywhere. Therefore, it was only speculation that Norman had anything to do with the hairs being found in her body. Um, remember that I mentioned a young girl named Roxy? Well, though she was connected to Norman, California ultimately declined to extradite Norman. And in the early 1980s, Norman legally changed his last name to his mother's last name, which was Chapman. He also made numerous requests to be transferred to a Canadian prison. And that is because by 1985 in Canada, he will be eligible for parole. However, those requests must have been denied. And he is still housed in the mark. Um, I believe it's called Marquette Branch Prison in Marquette, Michigan. Um, the murder of the other six girls remain officially unsolved. So, you know, with that, going back a little bit to what I had mentioned before about the hairs that were found inside Karen, his defense team, obviously, that was just poor, um, how should I put it, like, like, 
a, a poor argument to bring up because how else would she have gotten the hairs inside of her body and obviously the family was away on vacation so it wasn't the sons of david who had put it there um cameron was never in his basement to begin with so obviously you know it's a strong argument but i'm gonna give it to the jury because they actually deliberated for three days that's that's pretty much a long time usually like if they come back really fast you know it's they already have made up their minds that he was guilty but with three days of deliberation you can tell they really did look into the case did really look into what they were told and reviewed the information they received during the trial and then came with a guilty verdict so I, to me he definitely got a fair um trial um there was also something else that i one is that i wanted to mention his mom really never made a big deal that he beat up his sister it doesn't seem like she like applauded anything he did but you know i feel like she should have reported him but i guess during these times you don't really call the police much to say anything um so i i guess that's why it was never reported but she should have known like her son was no good and shouldn't have had any doubts of who he was when he beat up her daughter the way that he did unless she was okay with it i mean i really don't know and i'm one to hate to pass judgment especially when i didn't live during those times and i didn't witness anything um besides that you know that's kind of like mostly what i think about him like i i really don't i really do think he committed a lot of the murders the one murder that i don't think he committed was that where the girl was not found naked and obviously his mo was like he would sexually assault these girls and he would leave them naked so i honestly do not believe that he killed that girl that was found with clothing on i do believe she that her death was caused by somebody else what i found crazy was that when her body was reinspected years later she actually had the dna of three killers on her and i have mentioned that one of them was four years old at the time to me that was just a mistake of the um person doing exams they must have mixed up some you know some dna some way or another not paying attention to what they're doing and unfortunately that young girl had three different dna's on her and i think if a, if her case ever did go to trial they will have a difficult time just because the examiner had made that mistake to mix dna like that um so anyway you know many people do assume that norman's hatred towards women stemmed from him hating his own mother i really think it's a combination of being mentally deranged um experienced domestic violence abandonment issues and hating his own self i think he enjoyed the thrill of abusing women and taking their lives after beauty, um brutally abusing them and i think that was his own way to feel power over them i mean i'm sure people who study serial killers and other killers would have a much broader and elaborate like information based on that but honestly these are just my assumptions i really don't know this is not something that i studied in you know i didn't study how serial killers think or how killers think and so i really don't know but that's just my assumption with the little that i do know um you know i don't really know why domestic violence impacts people differently but it does you know and that's where we have to be so careful with allowing domestic violence into our lives into the lives of our children because we don't know how this violence affects them sometimes it affects people that they want to do better by the world and sometimes it makes people just want to treat other people bad like i was treated bad so i'm going to treat you bad um so i'm assuming well not assuming that's what i think happens is like everybody experiences trauma different and everybody then puts it back out into the world however they feel um i also don't understand why like people are really affected by watching their parents be you know be involved in different relationships obviously it seems in this case that norman was affected by watching his mother being involved with different men and i guess it it made him feel a certain way about women so if he engaged in anything with women in which they weren't married i guess it reminded him of his mom you know being involved with different men so that's how he maybe picked his victims like hey you know you're not a decent lady here you left with me and you're not even married so maybe that was his way of thinking you know honestly beats me but definitely 
you know creepy dude creepy story i didn't want to mention ted bundy at all but he does give ted bundy vibes you know one day i'll do a video on ted bundy but i definitely don't want to compare the two at all they're both just crazy dudes you know if you ask me but that's you know basically all i have for you guys i hope you like this green this green color i got it from the dollar tree um i'm sorry about my super and all his background noise but um anyway so i hope you like this color i hope you like this simple little dotted design that i did for you guys um and that's all i have for you my loves and as i say say no to murderers and yes to murder stories and i will catch you guys in my next one bye